I've been the Archbishop of New Zealand Diocese and the Anglican Church in Aotearoa, New Zealand and Polynesia uh, for eight years leading up to 2013. And then I was uh, called to this role in Rome as the Archbishop of Canterbury's representative to the Holy See and director of the Anglican Centre in Rome. And my family and I needed to pray about that, to think about it. It's a huge step. We were going to have to commute because my wife is based in her vacation in New Zealand and certainly couldn't get a job in Rome. We agreed to commute, going home three times a year, going there three times a year, using FaceTime almost every day. And I think FaceTime itself has made the family links live a lot. You sit down with a cup of coffee in the morning, have an hour with your family, chatting on FaceTime. It's very life-giving and probably the, the reason I was able to do this job. The challenge that were facing the Anglican Centre in Rome at the time that I began were to do with trying to make the most of partnership with a new pontificate. Because when I arrived, Benedict had just resigned. I was appointed during his pontificate, then he resigned before I arrived. I arrived and Pope Francis was in the chair of Peter. So there was the unknown area of a new pope, a new approach to ecumenism, a new vision and mission. And that's been exceeding every expectation as we look at our capacity for partnership, getting closer together, recognizing that what we have in common is far greater than what divides us. And I think the uh, unfolding of this pontificate at the same time as my role was unfolding was one of the great gifts of my time here. Uh, I can't thank God enough for paralleling the time of Pope Francis' first four years. So the challenges facing me as I arrived in 2013 were, what would this new pontificate mean for Anglican Roman Catholic partnership? What might be possible uh, in this next pontificate between us? And he, the Pope has exceeded every expectation we might have had about collaboration, best practice, sharing, dialogue, becoming more friendly, greater cooperation. And so really the first challenge of my time was to uh, explore a new pontificate from an Anglican point of view and it's been blessed by God in many ways. The pace of relationship between Catholics and Anglicans in Rome has quickened in the last four years. It's built on the work of over 50 years actually of partnership between popes and archbishops of Canterbury, dialogue, careful, slow, unspectacular work over many decades. But what we're seeing now is an acceleration of the potential that those people brokered and negotiated. What unites us is greater than what divides us. We agree on over 90% of core doctrine. We are called to the same kingdom of God, the same mission, the same vocation in the world, and making the most of that, linking arms with a town and a basin as servants of the servants of God together, uh, is the great potential that lies before us now. And we're seeing all kinds of signs of that promise and that calling. My role here in Rome is to be the personal representative of the Archbishop of Canterbury to the Holy See and also director of the Anglican Centre here in Rome. That's a two-sided role. It means relating to the Vatican as a kind of diplomat or ambassador on behalf of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Anglican Communion as a whole. But it also means being director of a centre where education, hospitality, best practice, collaboration and joint projects are brokered. So I've got a two-way role uh, to bring the best of Anglican Christianity to Rome uh, and represent it to the Vatican and to represent the best of Catholic Christianity to the Anglican Communion and to the Archbishop of Canterbury. It's a two-way bridge. Just recently uh, in Rome, just over two weeks ago, we had this remarkable experience of a Pope visiting an Anglican parish for the very first time in the world. The first time he's ever visited All Saints Parish, Bambuino Street in Rome on its 200th anniversary. Pope John Paul II had visited cathedrals in England, but no pope had ever visited a local parish church. And he blended in with the children, with a choir, with a question and answer session at the end. It was friendly, he laughed, and we enjoyed a warm engagement and encounter with him. The text of which will stay with us for decades. It's been a remarkable and iconic visit and encounter. And then, just last Monday, on the 13th of March, we had a breakthrough where the Archpriest of the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome warmly allowed us to conduct the Office of Evensong, the old Benedictine Office of Compline and Vespers, morphed together into Anglican Evensong in the 16th and 17th centuries, brought back now to the Basilica of St. Peter, to the heartland of the Catholic faith, 
by Anglicans, led by an Anglican bishop, but with a Roman Catholic archbishop preaching, Catholic cardinal sensing the tomb of Pope Gregory the Great, whose feast day we were honoring. Uh, what a wonderful breakthrough for the very first time. And this has gone viral all over the world, on Facebooks, uh, on FaceTime, uh, on YouTube. Uh, it'll be something we can live and relive for many years to come. We'd long believed that we should honour the feast day of Gregory the Great in Rome, because his tomb is here in St. Peter's Basilica, the Pope who sent St. Augustine to England to convert the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in 595. So we planned for over a year to have an even song on the feast day of Gregory the Great. We approached Ar Cardinal Angelo Comastri, the archpriest of the Basilica, some time ago to see if he thought that would be all right. And we suggested the altar of the chair of St. Peter in the heart of the Basilica, not far from the tomb of Pope Gregory. He was gracious and welcoming and every uh, hospitality was offered to us. And then we found out that Merton College Oxford Choir would happen to be in Rome on pilgrimage that very week. What a gift of synchronicity, a gift from God. And so they happily agreed to partner us and sang the choral office of Evensong to an extremely high standard for which I think every Anglican would be proud. Uh, everyone who attended was moved to their core and I think the very best of Anglican Christianity was offered to the very best venue that the Roman Catholic Church could afford. It was a great day. On day three of Pope Francis's pontificate, he wrote to the Pontifical Academy of Science and Social Science to Bishop Sanchez Sorondo, saying, I would like you to look into the question of trafficking and slavery, because the bishop had asked him what he might research in this new pontificate. At exactly the same time, the Archbishop of Canterbury had it on his heart to address slavery and trafficking. At exactly the same time, the Ecumenical Patriarch and indeed some Muslim groups had been thinking of exactly the same thing independently of each other. But then with the assistance of the Walk Free Network run by Andrew Forrest in Perth and Australia, an NGO against slavery, we got together and created the Global Freedom Network, a multi-faith group against slavery and trafficking. And our first goal was to get a religious leader's statement against slavery and trafficking for the whole world so that every world faith could identify with a text which said slavery is unacceptable, trafficking is a crime against humanity, we must mobilize from our faith bases against this global evil. We achieved that, including Shia and Sunni Muslims, including Buddhist, Jewish, um, a whole range of multi-faith members, partners together in Rome, signing a declaration with the Pope against slavery and trafficking. That was then pushed all over the world and agreed to by, by thousands of people. Then the organization itself needed a major gear change and it morphed itself slowly into a group called the Global Sustainability Network, which is the same partners with a new name, with some new resources, but moving on from that base that was created in the first place. The Vatican are involved through the Pontifical Academy, so are Muslims, so is the Anglican Communion through Bishop Alistair Redfern of Derby, uh, and so the cause continues. Anglicans, Orthodox, Catholics, many Reformed churches have long been passionate about a sense of stewardship for the care of creation and a concern over the growing polluting of the earth, whatever cause you associate that with. And our responsibility as stewards and gardeners to help clean up our backyard, uh, the only planet we've got, the only home we've got. And this came together, I believe, in the Pope's initiative when he wrote the encyclical Laudato Si, a message effectively to the world, but timed to be delivered to the Paris talks on the environment. And I know of no mainline Christian group who doesn't agree with the thrust, the biblical theology, the philosophy and the approach of that encyclical. And they got in behind this approach at the parish talks and endorsed it entirely. And so we're now seeing Christian solidarity around the world on this cause. Again, the same global faith leaders, the Pope, Ecumenical Patriarch, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the World Council of Churches, and their aid and network agencies have long been involved in refugee ministry. And what we're seeing now with a rapid increase in refugees seeking asylum, sometimes sadly through traffickers, sometimes getting into flimsy uh, boats heading for Lampedusa, the refugee island, trying to pour out of Aleppo, trying to pour out of North Africa, uh, out of Syria itself. 
And the church's response uh, is to try to meet this huge flood of humanity who are escaping tyranny, uh, civil war, famine and oppression. But tragically, many of them meet their fate as they leave. And so the churches have cooperated through Caritas International, Sant'Egidio Community and other aid agencies to create a humanitarian corridor which is safe passage out of troubled countries so that a refugee visa can be given to refugees in a new land. Initially it was Italy, as of yesterday it's also France and we hope the host countries will grow. The Anglicans are now joining this procedure through a partnership we hope to operate with Sant'Egidio here in Rome, where Anglican money, Anglican friends, Anglican partnership, Anglican resources can join with Sant'Egidio, this Catholic lay movement to assist in the humanitarian corridor work, shelter, advocacy, education, a new future. When I finish my work here in Rome in June, I'll be heading back to New Zealand to retirement. I'm 65, but I know the church will not. Uh, uh, let me lie, I'm, and I hope not either. I hope to be involved in theological education, in voluntary ministry work. Uh, I'll be very active with my family and with my church for a long time to come.